Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 63 of the podcast. It's the 15th of March, 2017, as I record this intro. In this episode, I chat with Shannon Laux about gentle parenting. Shannon is an unschooling mom to two great kids, and they are a Canadian family who have been transplanted in California for seven years now. That's definitely an interesting adventure. It was a really fun conversation, and I appreciate that she took the time to chat with me. She also shares her perspective on unschooling and gentle parenting on her website, breakingdaylight.org, and you'll find the link to it in the show notes. This last week has been reasonably uneventful, which is super nice too. Michael hasn't had his usual days off because it's March break here, so the kids are off school and at Medieval Times they're doing three shows a day. He's in the midst of working nine days straight, but he'll be home in a couple more days, so that'll be fun. Lissy's in New York City, so they stocked up on food and made plans to stay home for winter storm Stella. She said they got lots of snow though not as much as fell where Ann Omen lives in rural New York. They've been busy with that. Uh, The storm did manage to change course and miss us here around Toronto. We ended up with maybe an inch. So I think we're all looking forward to spring. I want to say a big thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. I deeply appreciate your support. And a big welcome to new patron Caroline Silver. Thank you very much for joining us. I love that you guys are helping me share unschooling information with anyone who's curious to learn more and explore this wonderful lifestyle. If you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. This week's quote is from our guest, Shannon. Turning toward parenting as who I am and not a job I do affords me the freedom to be my best self at each turn of the journey. Just let that sink in for the next while. Let it roll around in the background of your days and see how it feels. Do you think of parenting as a job you do or as part of who you are? Either way, how does that perspective play out in your days? How does it influence your choices? the big ones and all the little ones. Does that lens help you be your best self? Because in the end, that's our wish, right? To be our best selves. So have fun with that. And now on to the interview with Shannon. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca. And today I'm here with Shannon Laux. Hi, Shannon. Hi. Hi. Shannon is mom to two always unschooled boys and founder of the website BreakingDaylight.org, where she writes about her family's unschooling experience. I really love your tagline, Shannon, uh, because happy childhoods are built on peaceful parents. Yes. Yes, I think that's awesome. So let's dive right into our conversation. And to get us started, can you share with us a bit about you and your family and how you guys came to unschooling? Yes. um, My background was in education. I went to university thinking I wanted to be a teacher and I got my five-year degree and then realized that what I was looking for, the magic of learning, wasn't actually happening in the public school system. So I ended up on this path of alternative environments, learning environments internationally in preschools where Play and um, inquiry were the focus of the learning. And when I got pregnant with my first son, my husband and I decided to live on one income right away because we knew that it didn't make sense for me to be working with other people's children and sending my child to live with, or not live with <laughs> you know, to learn with somebody who at the time would have been a stranger. 
Mm -hmm. And we really in the beginning thought we made the room with the crib and the baby theme and had this vision that we would put our child into his crib and he would sleep there. Mm -hmm. And then we met him and (laughs) you begin, you know, that moment where you become a mom and you have to keep Mm -hmm. this fragile, what feels like this fragile little human being alive. And it never once made sense to put him anywhere other than near me. And he wasn't going to sleep anywhere that wasn't touching me or on me or near me. So I always say that he really started the journey um, because I took a lot of my cues from him. I kept him close and we, you know, breastfed on demand. And so slid into what I found looking backwards was attachment parenting. And, um, through toddlerhood, the same thing, even when his brother came along, it was always about following their lead because they were really great at feedback as to, um, what was going to make them happy. And I always thought with the sleeping, how we all ended up sleeping together, the goal was sleep. And so as long as we were close to each other, everyone was sleeping. And as they got older, um, we had, my husband didn't have a great experience in public school. So he was on board with keeping the boys at home. And we didn't ever have a plan that this is what our homeschooling would look like. But bringing my experience forward to noticing that children learn the most and are engaged and passionate when it is self-driven, self-directed, inquiry-based, we just carried on the attachment parenting to following their lead. They'd learned how to talk. They'd learned how to walk. So it made sense to my brain that they would learn what they needed as we moved forward. Um, and then when they were about two and four, I was offered a position working with a, a place called uh, Self Design. And it was basically a place where I could get an income supporting other families that were learning at home. And that's where I came to the term unschooling, saw it for the first time, um, and began to build community around that. We were fortunate that on Vancouver Island, where we were living at the time, there was some beautiful families that I met through helping them get some some government funds to support their unschooling life. And that then gave me language to explain what we were doing at home with our children. Um, and also gave us the opportunity to begin building a community. That's really cool. I remember um, back all those years ago when I was first, uh, when I first discovered homeschooling and unschooling on the internet, I remember seeing (laughs) self-design on the other side of the country (laughs) and thinking, gee, that's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think now it's less awesome because the ministry has had to put restrictions, but at the time it was a beautiful way to for me to be that bridge just because I'd spent the money on education to help the families get some funds and to take the worry away from them about what the learning, you know, I could go ministry speak for them and they could, yeah, exactly. The education know. ease. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they could continue just having, and it was cool for me too, to have that window into how other people were unschooling. I felt super blessed to um, be able to witness that. And I still have relationships with all of those families and their kids um, as part of our community, even this far away. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, that's why I love hearing everybody's stories because there is such interesting paths, right? Mm -hmm. There are just so many different ways that we can connect and just first hear about things as long as we're open to noticing them, right? So I think that's, that's really cool. And the piece about that, that's the other reason I, I, you know, over the years, we still say, uh, you know, that we're pretty happy in Ontario, although we don't get any government funding support, you know, when we watch Alberta and um, Vancouver and stuff and um, see how sometimes the government involvement can, can become increased, right? Yeah. And you have less freedom when you're, it, it just seems like quite a compromise, right? It does. Yeah. And yeah. as being the mom and having my boys in the program, um, it does, agreeing to be in that relationship, it does interrupt what you're doing with your children, even when you have the best of intentions. 
Mm-hmm. There were moments where I had to take the free, joyful learning that they were doing and translate it. And it did interrupt us. So that's mm-hmm. my like looking backwards. Um, or now when people are like, why don't you join a charter school? There's lots of money. And I still just think it will interrupt what we are doing. And I don't want to interrupt that. That's true. You you have to work so much harder to yeah. to get past that each time, right? And it just brings up more of, I think it has, would have you questioning yourself more often, right? Absolutely. Because, be, because you're noticing the difference, not focusing just on what you have in front of you and what you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So speaking of your boys, I'd love to hear what they're up to, the maybe some things that they're interested in and how they're pursuing it. Okay. Well, my oldest son is 14 and well, almost 15. He mm-hmm. has these three sort of passions that have uh, I can see have weaved their way, way through his whole life. And one is music. Um, when he was five, he fell in love with the band, band or between the age of four and five, he fell in love with the band Green Day. And yeah. he would watch their videos and pretend he was in the band <laughs> and he dressed, you know, like he dressed like the all the members of the band. Um, and so as time has gone on, he has taught himself to play different instruments. It started with the ukulele and then he took what he knew about the ukulele and applied that to the guitar, which I would say is his favorite instrument. He has a number of guitars now. He is, has written a couple of his own pieces, but is very private about it. Um, for a short time, he was doing covers, and so he started a YouTube channel called I've Got That Covered, <laughs> and he would do covers of other people's songs, um, and then he also has taught himself some drums, which had present, presented a real challenge, because going from ukulele to guitar was natural, but the drums bring in a whole different element. Mm-hmm. Uh, And also, he has always loved hockey from as long as I can remember, which is a good Canadian boy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He had a grandfather who loved the Montreal Canadiens and a grandmother who loves the Vancouver Canucks. And so from as soon as he was born, he would get um, gifts of Montreal Canadian. Oh, no, grandma's going to have to up that with some Vancouver Canucks. So he's going (laughs) to this theme and he has played when we first immigrated to the u.s he needed a suit because when you are going to play an away game as a hockey player you dress in a suit so we Mm -hmm. showed up with my seven-year-old dressed in a suit for his away game (laughs) (laughs) so he did a small stint probably three years where he actually played ice hockey And uh, that was challenging because there's, you know, a different energy here where we live um, in Sharks territory. It's very competitive. The coaching was not um, kind. And he's Mm -hmm. looking, he's looking to collaborate. He's not looking to be told, you know, you're not, you suck as a team and you guys need to pull up your bootstraps. He's like, why don't we come together and make a plan? So Mm. that element of it ended up ending sort of his on ice time. Um, Now he, why he watches all the games commentates. He follows the players. He follows the draft. He follows um, the video games. NHL 17 is his favorite right now. He builds his own teams in there. And I've heard him lately talking about careers in hockey that don't, involve skates on the ice necessarily yeah and he plays hockey in our we just we have a new sunroom now which he thinks is great because it can be the hockey room so he, mm-hmm. he still gets his stick out regularly and then I guess the third piece for him would be gaming he's pretty um involved in gaming right now it's Minecraft NHL 17 and League of Legends mm. um So those would be his three interests. And then KJ is younger and it's been fascinating to watch him pick up some of the same strands as his brother, though he's never loved hockey and he's never been a musician. So as he's getting older, I'm seeing him sort of step into the things that call to his heart. 
which I would say definitely are anime and Japanese culture. He is very drawn to that um, genre, I guess, and Mm -hmm. dreams of going to Tokyo. That is his top place where he would like to go is to Tokyo to just drink in the culture that is there. So we've spent some time learning some Japanese and luckily here we have a couple of options. Uh, San Francisco has a beautiful um, Japan town as does San Jose. And so we can go there and he's learned to make sushi and he is now exploring virtual reality to um, go along with his passion for gaming as well. Both my boys yeah. are gamers. And so he has a virtual reality set, the Vive, and is exploring the new games that are coming out with that and, you know, dipping his toe in interests of what game creation would look like. Would he like to be a story person? Uh, what does coding look like? So he's just starting to... Um, question that area and also baking and cooking or something he's been interested in late last night he made us all cupcakes (laughs) awesome (laughs) yeah it was nice to wake up to yeah wow that's I really love that like how you can see how they all kind of flow and connect and weave I, I do love that word and you mentioned that as well just how these things kind of just bubble up Mm -hmm. and when they catch their interest they just bubble more and more right yes absolutely and I it's great to watching them go from you know taking those passions that they had in childhood and as they come into the world of teenagers how that shapes and informs them and, and going almost into it deeper or some of the passions fall away but this depth that comes to the passion is um super fascinating to me yes and i think that's why i'm i'm always talking about um the importance of space and time Mm -hmm. because giving our children that that open time and um I get open space, but, you know, without, without any expectations, um, to, to just explore freely and see where their mind, um, takes them. Um, It's just fascinating to see how they dive and shift and, and, and things thread together. mm -hmm. And, And sometimes it's not quite obvious, right? At first, but eventually when you're looking back, you can see how, how these threads and twists and turns, uh, kind of evolved, right? Absolutely. And how, um, the open space to me, if I tried to create a curriculum around what they're doing, I would have missed the mark on thousands of things and would have steered them in a direction that wasn't natural to step back and just be that person that supports the time and the space. I'm always awestruck by where it takes them and what are the pieces that pull at their heart and the ones that they want to go deeper into are so different from what my sort of what my mind would have thought. Yes, that is an awesome point. And that's that's exactly exactly it, because I know if, if that was my interest, I know all the different ways I would have taken it. Yes. And if I would have jumped in to, you know, just give those and to encourage those particular twists, it would have been so different because they just go in so many different and amazing places that are really really them. And, yeah. and it helps you see how different we all are as people, doesn't it? It totally does. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So let's move on. Um, you wrote a wonderful article that I loved uh, that was posted on flow Gascon site about your top five fridge worthy reminders for gentle connected parenting. Now, I will link to that post in the show notes for everyone, but I wanted to talk in depth about a couple of the points that you made. Okay. For yay, first was your reminder to listen more, talk less. Oh, this might tie nicely into what we were talking about. Yes. <laughs> because, yes, this was such a valuable shift for me. It does make a profound difference in how so many situations play out, doesn't it? In turn, and that's where we can build our trust and connection with them in our relationships by um, just listening more and not bringing our our opinions and our thoughts into it not 
too quickly. You know what I mean? So I was hoping you could explain what you mean by that, that seemingly simple idea of just listening more and talking less. Yeah, I think it's what you say. Um, it can be super easy as the parent to rush in with our ideas or our solutions or even our judgments in any of these situations. However, when we slow down to listen, then we get to connect with our child. It pauses whatever story is running in the back of our mind, and it creates the opportunity for really deeper understanding of the person our child is or the struggle our child is having. Um, because I think it's so true that not all the problems our children or struggles our children are having um, need to be fixed. Some of them just need to be listened to or witnessed or seen maybe. Um, and when we can stop and simply listen quietly, it's creating space for our child to be seen, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it really makes sense because that, it, it <laughs> we were both trying to find the words, but it's that um, opening for yes. them to, to process, you know, and, and it's what a big thing to learn for myself and then for my kids that we don't need to rush to a solution because in fact, when we wait and, and give it space, um, to maybe bubble up more, we find better solutions mm -hmm. than the one we would have rushed in with, right? I, I know when, even when my kids were like in conflict with each other, if I tried to rush in and solve things, again, I'd be trying to solve it from my perspective, what seemed fair from my perspective. But that truly, not all the time, not even often sometimes, actually met their needs mm -hmm. in that unique situation. And by giving them um, that space, by listening to them, we actually got more to the heart. And, and like you said, that's how we connect because we learn so much more about each other when we give that space for things, for them to talk and tell uh, us. Absolutely, because so many times what I thought, like you're saying, what I thought was happening what I mm -hmm. thought was going on isn't, wasn't true. And so if I'd come in with my, well, son, in this situation, you should, <laughs> that, 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 I would have shut the door to knowing what really was going on underneath mm -hmm. because I would have put my lens on the situation or my interpretation. And I also think it creates that space, like you're saying to, um, it's like that power with instead of power over. So if mm -hmm. I'm able, if we're lit, if I'm listening and pulling out the information with my child, then we're working together on a solution. We're doing what might be this hard thing together instead of either one of us feeling alone in it. The situation that has come up a lot for us in immigrating, like moving in, moving to California hasn't been the top choice for either of my boys. And so there have been times when it has been very emotional and they have said things that are so hard to hear, but I feel like my job at that point was just to sit there and hear them to create that space because my child was sharing something that needed to get out of their body or their mind. And mm -hmm. if I had tried to say anything in that moment, I would have shut them down. Instead, I got to sit side by side with my husband and witness my child in this really, really hard place instead of him feeling like he had to do that alone in his bedroom. I think that is so important because, you know, when we when we talk about, you know, not getting actively involved and taking over situations, sometimes I worry that people might take that as in, well, I shouldn't get involved. Right? right. And then they're not there with them. No, that that's a huge piece. Just being there with them, even being a witness, they, they know your, your energy is there. You're bringing so much to the situation just by being there with them. You know what I mean? And it's that piece of trust because my mm -hmm. trusts me. He'll come to me, you know, because I've listened before and not just been the parrot or, you know, the one talking. 
um, they, he trusted me to come to me with this big feeling because, Mm -hmm. and that trust piece just feels so important to me because the older our children get, I suspect the more challenging the things that they're going to come up against are and to be that trusted ally that they can come to with whatever feeling or whatever struggle or whatever conflict they come up against. I just feel like it's such an honor to have that trust to be a part of their conflict or their, um, con- or their, um, even they're just their critical thinking, you know, to, mm-hmm. and so by sitting there listening and offering when the moment is, is ready, then I get a front row seat in that unfolding instead of um, being shut out, I guess. Yeah. In the processing and, mm-hmm. and that, that's my experience, you know, as they get older, it's true. They don't need our hands and our help for a lot of the day to day things, but it's still um, so much of our time and our heart mm-hmm. in being with them through, like you said, um, more challenging um, situations come. They, you know, they're more emotional, they're more moral, they're, you know, so mm-hmm. many other things rather than can you help me put this together or yes. can you help <laughs> me find, you know, can we go out and buy this particular game or, you know, whatever those things still happen, but they take care of them so much more, Mm -hmm. but it's not like all of a sudden we have nothing to do. No, it, I think, um, our time and attention just shifts more to these, these kinds of, um, conversations, just witnessing, processing, being there with them in, in different ways. And I'm always, often I'm surprised by when I listen for a longer time than my, cause I have to bite my tongue. I want to jump in and fix everything. Yep. <laughs> there, right. So I am often amazed by the solutions that they can come up with that weren't even, it's like we were saying before, it wasn't even on my mind to, to think of that as a solution. Um, one, my son was having a conflict with in hockey and I had a whole bunch of ideas on how I wanted to resolve it. And he, I listened for a while and I was like, what do you think we should do about this? And he's like, I think I want to talk to the coach. And I was like, that wasn't like him Mm -hmm. taking control of the situation and being in charge of communicating with the coach was not on my radar. And yet because that I didn't offer my solutions (laughs) first, um, he was able to sort of own that decision and own where we took it. And it was a super powerful experience for him. It's so powerful. And even for me, I learn, I continue to learn so much from them by stepping back and seeing where they take things because, uh, you know, they are, they are so generous and the way their, their mind works, the way they see the situation, because you know what, it's their situation. They Mm -hmm. see more aspects to it. Sometimes they have just so much more patience for the situation (laughs) than, than I would. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) So I learned to be a better person just by watching how they process. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's get to that other reminder that I wanted to touch on, which is another big piece. Um, Apologize. So a couple of episodes ago, I was speaking with Emma Marie Ford uh, about a book on attachment theory. And the author, David Howe, mentioned that even sensitive caregivers only get it right about 50% of the time. But that what stands out is that they actively acknowledge and repair the disconnecting moments. So I had just, you know, gone through that. And then I was um, reading your stuff and your reminder to apologize just meshed so clearly for me, that connection. So I was wondering if you could share your experience with apologizing to your children and the value you've seen from it. Oh, it's super powerful. The first, um, I mean, for me, it's about own ownership. And, um, I remember as a little girl, uh, feeling that things that happened outside of my control were my fault and sort of taking on these problems that had nothing to do with me. And I think that when we apologize to our children, we sort of lift that burden from them so that we take back and be like, no, dude, that was me. I made a wrong decision in that moment and I truly am sorry for that. And so as they're younger, I think it, 
it does sort of take away some some burden that they might have otherwise carried where they felt at fault for something that wasn't theirs when mm-hmm. the first round of of potty training is the first time I have a clear memory of apologizing because I had a young baby at the time and a toddler and I I was ready for diapers to be over with and my son was not ready for them to be over with and I had a frustrating moment where I had been like dude if you can just go on the potty I will give you the big red freezy that you love and he was devastated and cried so hard because he wasn't ready to do what I was asking him to do and he couldn't do it. So now not only was he disappointing mom, he was also missing out on this freezy. And mm-hmm. I just remember dropping to my knees eye to eye with him and being like, we're going to go get that freezy. And I am so sorry I set you up like that. That was completely not okay, buddy. Um, that was mommy's fault. I know you're trying your hardest. (laughs) Right. And so it does that. It also does that repairing of relationship really quickly. Like it could have caused distance and it could have made it harder for us to move forward. But when we apologize to our children, it repairs whatever may have had the potential to be damaged in the interaction. And I think that repairing piece is what allows us to reconnect and recover and move forward from the place of intention instead of the reaction to a circumstance. I love that. I love the the idea of releasing that burden because I, I you know what I think it ties to too? Because when I was thinking about the way um, they, they talk about how we build our relationship patterns, yeah. um, when we have a disconnecting moment, they're trying to make sense of it, yeah. right? They're like, oh, this is how relationships go. This is new. I need to make sense of this. So that's that burden they're feeling. It's like all of a sudden there's this anomaly mm-hmm. and I need to make sense of it and incorporate that into my new view of how I relate to my mom or to whoever, right? Exactly. So, Yeah. So when we acknowledge that, we're like, oh, that is an an anomaly. That was their fault. I don't need to revise my picture, right? Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, I can think of so many opportunities I've had. And even when apologizing, when they say, no, that's okay, mom. And sometimes they say, it's actually not okay that I Mm -hmm. did, that I did that, or that I said that. And here's why I feel like it's not okay. So it almost, it, gives, like you're saying, even more depth to that picture for them to understand that I know where my errors were and where I can, you know, and that they can trust that next time something like that comes up, I will have a different reaction because I'm reflecting on how things went poorly this time. Yeah. And it's not, it's not the idea of like apologizing or like that we should apologize with the expectation that it's going to, you know, just erase what we did. That, yeah, I I love that point because, you know, maybe it did really hurt, you know, them Mm -hmm. and, and they, they've seen a new side of us maybe Mm -hmm. that they hadn't seen before that. Okay. I'm glad she understands that, but you know, she can, she can go to that place. It, it isn't, it's all learning about each other. You know, uh, yeah. we had a Q and a Q&A a while ago, you know, where the mom said she kind of hit her limit, you know, so that's part of learning of us learning about ourselves so that we don't put ourselves in a position where we are right at the edge ourselves. We try to take care of ourselves before, but our kids also know that, Oh, there's an edge. Yes. It's so much learning, isn't it? <laughs> oh, what much learning from, from both sides. Absolutely. Exactly. Now, you have a great story on your blog about your youngest son and his love for surprise snacks. So I was hoping you could share a bit about your journey through your own expectations around food prep and how you got to where you came up with a beautifully creative way to make his wish for nighttime <laughs> surprise snacks come true. I love that story. <laughs> I, I, I love it, too, because on the flip side, my other son is very specific about what he wants to eat. So there's no uh-huh. just showing up with food for him. Yeah, so- <laughs> no surprises. <laughs> Great to have them. And um, it, yeah, so is from as long as I can remember, KJ has, he doesn't want to be bothered with figuring out what he wants to eat. 
but he would like it to show up in front of him and be some accurate information. So it's about, um, I think, sometimes I wonder if it's about his love language, because it is about being seen, me knowing mm -hmm. him, me knowing what he likes to eat, and me showing up with that. Um, and it around the food prep, for me, the shift had to come from shifting out of obligation and into choice. So I could be frustrated every time he, and I'll be truthful. There were times when I was frustrated and he said, get me a surprise snack. And I was like, tell me what you want to eat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, but when in making that shift of, it was an opportunity um, for me, instead of to show up with a bitter, resentful sandwich, I could show up instead with love and kindness. And everybody who receives a offering of a sandwich made lovingly, I swear it tastes better. It um, does. <laughs> so I had to do the internal work of realizing what is my goal here? Is my goal to just slap together some food and have them go away? Or is my goal to make food, to make um, cooking something that we that is joyful and that is a way to connect with each other. And so that shift helped me come up with new ideas. And then it, it, when you come at it from that place, it's exciting for me to put, because now I'm making this food, thinking about what he's going to experience when it's 12 o'clock and everybody else has gone to bed because he's our night owl and he's hungry. He knows he can go to the fridge and there in the fridge is a little package of love from mom and I'm sleeping peacefully in my bed instead of being woken up and asked to come and make food and he's down there feeling loved. Mm -hmm. So it stopped being about having to make food, having to make dinner and it started being about um continuing that connection even when one of us isn't available. Yeah, that's that is a beautiful picture and it helps so much to to move up to that bigger picture, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. I absolutely. Yeah. I remember I was going through <clears throat> that that whole shift from obligation to choice. Um for me it was dinner prep. Mm. I think, right? It's that whole um it was reasonably easy to get through the expectation, you know, that everybody like it and be grateful, right. you know, that, that kind of thing. But I mean, that's, that's where I had to start, mm -hmm. you know, because that was an expectation that I knew as a child, right? Right. You know, when, when we grew up with that kind of environment. So it took some thinking and, and it was seeing the bigger picture, you know, how could this dinner experience be, you know, more, more enjoyable for everyone involved. And how it kind of developed for us was my dinners, um, we, we've ended up always being kind of buffet style, mm -hmm. like for the last dozen years or so. So basically I would make, you know, three or four different things that would all go together nicely, but that I knew everybody really liked at least one of the things. Right. 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 And then, and then people had, you know, instead of I made this thing and if you don't like it, you can make yourself a sandwich. <laughs> right. And that, you know, cause that didn't feel loving. No. And that's the piece, like the undoing of your own old stories and also finding the intention of what is my intention around food. And for me with the boys, the intention has always been for them to have a healthy relationship with food. And what I mean by that is not that they eat their fruits and vegetables, but that they mm -hmm. know what food feels like in their body. They know what textures they like. They know what tastes they like. And that can't come if I'm imposing rules or ideas around food. It only comes through experimentation. Yeah, that's what that's another reason why I ended up with, you know, kind of a smorgasbord of <laughs> things and and you know every week is there something new that you'd like to try is there something you want me to make sure that I make this week you know and so kind of the menu prep before I went grocery shopping was always collaborative yes and you know what nine times out of ten they're all like no fine no fine it's not very often you know 
that that they wanted to bring something new into the equation. So, you know, I knew I was doing pretty good at guessing <laughs> things that they want. Although sometimes you're like, please just give me an idea. <laughs> it's so new. I know. And it's fun too. Now with social media, there's been a few times where um, Mitchell has been like, oh, mom, I saw this cool thing on Tasty on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Should we try and make it? So, um, you know, he's, they're ready because it's been collaborative for so long, they're ready to jump in when they want to try something new. And I think that's super fun. It is super fun. Yeah, Joseph's been really exploring it. And Michael was very into baking for a while. Joseph's into soups and stews. Mm. Yeah, so it's it's all very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but that's it. You know, visit your your intent, your bigger picture intention around food. And like you said, with your youngest son, how how it's received. Yes. Right? He is so happy to open that fridge and be like, oh, there, there's something I want to eat. Um, and it, it's, yeah, it just feels yeah. good to both of us. It's really. Because it, it's not all about us, is it? Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now let's shift to gaming because uh, technology has developed so quickly that many of us, you know, we grew up with minimal access to it, you know, so, so the technology we have now is pretty unfamiliar for us. And not to mention that so many of the mainstream messages that we're getting are negative about technology and advocate strict control. But truly, it's not just a game, is it? Oh, it's never just a game. (laughs) Never, never, never just a game. (laughs) So I would love to hear about your parenting journey around technology and gaming. Yeah, it was the probably one of the areas I struggled with the most in the beginning. Um, And I uh, remember specifically my husband um, was he gamed and he wanted video games for the boys. And I had been like, no way video games are not coming into our house. And the boys had seen them at friends place and they had loved them. And I was arguing with my husband at the time we lived just up the road from my mom. And we had a huge argument in that four house walk and he, <laughs> he was adamant. And he just said to me, they're my kids too. And I was like, okay. And he brought out a video game machine and the boys loved it, of course. Mm-hmm. And, um, but my oldest son got very frustrated with it and there was a lot of frustration. And then they, the boys went to bed and my husband came to me and he said, you were right. I remember feeling that frustrated. We need to get rid of this thing. Mm-hmm. And so we, the boys woke up in the morning and we did the, the moment of, Oh, sorry guys, the system broke. And the boys were so sad and so devastated. Um, And it didn't make video games go away. It didn't Mm -hmm. change it. But I remember thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm lying to my children. What is more important right now? The relationship I have with them, this foundation that we're going to build a lifetime on top of, or video games. Was I going to be the person that lied to my children or was I going to be the person that partnered with my children to explore their interests? And so then I ended up being the one that was like, no, actually, I think we need to repair this. And so Mm. we started exploring different games and it started with um, Lego games on the laptop. And then when the laptop couldn't work, then it became video game. We got our Wii, which the boys thought was the coolest thing ever. Um, And that's not to say from that moment forward, I didn't have worries and concerns because they would always come up when we're living in a a definitely living where the mainstream theme, as you said, is limit control. And when you see your three year old sitting in front at the time, sitting in front of a TV and he's so excited and he's playing 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 and (laughs) the fear is rising and rising and rising. And then I like sit down and play with him. So because what I was fearing in that moment, I think, was the lack of connection with him or he's sucked into this video game. So when I sit down next to him, now we're having a conversation, we're playing together, we're laughing, we're connecting. And it's not about the video game. It's about whatever the activity is. If we were walking in the forest, we would be having conversation, enjoying what was right in front of us. So now instead of we're not walking, maybe we'll walk in the forest later, but right now we're doing this video game together and it's dispelling that myth that video games are something somebody plays in a dark bedroom all alone, isolated. They're not. 
games are something that we can play together and we can collaborate, we can talk about. Um, so again, just undoing that layer of story for myself. And then the other piece would be when that, because the fear and the concern, they come up and down and up and down. Yep, um, yep. And then when it would come up again, it was about pausing for that moment to see what was going on, to not be like, okay, I'm running my old story that he is playing a video game because he, and, and that he's just playing a video game. Mm-hmm. When I could take that extra breath, breath, the first thing I would witness is that my child was happy and engaged. Okay, that's a pretty good life goal to be happy mm-hmm. and engaged. But under all of that, they were working through puzzles. They were working through hard things. They were building reading skills. They were building critical thinking skills. They were problem solving. And it, for the large majority of the time, they were doing that in collaboration with other people which if you look at the tech industry right now, or most of the industries right now, the ability to use critical thinking skills and collaboration skills are what the workforce is built on moving forward. So when I could take the, you know, the story out of my head and drop into the moment and witness what was actually happening, then I saw beyond the video game and I saw my child and I saw their skills and I saw their happiness. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful, Shannon, because to me too, every time questions and fears started pondering up, um, bubbling up, it was, the answer was always to go hang out with my kid more Yes, because I was, I was, I wasn't seeing the big picture anymore. Right. I was just, um, seeing the tapes. Yeah. Right. Yep. So when when you go and you actively even even if you just watch for a bit, but but being with them is mm-hmm. even better because their joy is infectious, isn't it? It's so it so is. And when you are um, watching and engaging with them, you know, the game. And so, you know, the jump off points, you know, when it's time to be like, hey, who wants to figure out how to make quick revive so we can have our own juggernaut. Right. And so you're taking these mm-hmm. pieces out of a video game and now you're all in the kitchen and you're figuring out how to make this drink that you found a recipe for, or even that you're just using your own creativity for the number of times the video game popped off the screen and into the play that my children were doing or Mm -hmm. to the dinner table, to the meal that we decided to prepare. There's so many springboards, but you don't get those if you're not engaged with your child and knowing the game yourself so that you can find those sort of springboard moments. Yeah, the, if, if you think it's just a game and you're exactly. waiting for them to finish, right? There's, it's a window. It yeah, is a, a window. beautiful window into a whole world. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, I love that. I know. It's beautiful. Okay. I would like to chat about another conventional misconception, and that is teenagers. <laughs> So often we're told by family and friends that things may be great now, but wait until your kids are teenagers. I remember that one. Yes. And we we can, you know, see where they're coming from, though, when, when we look at from their perspective, because so often they're trying to hold onto their teens more tightly, right? Because yes. that fear. Um, and just at a moment when their teens are looking for more space, they're wanting to hold tighter. Mm-hmm. Or they're discounting their teens' perspective um, mm-hmm. and view of the world as naive and insisting that their way is the right way and that their teen needs to do it this way. But it's really a different ball game when we partner with them and try to help them reach their goals, isn't it? It so is because I, I understand that place of the consequences of the decisions our teenagers are making mm-hmm. could be larger. They could have a bigger impact. Um, but trying to get in the way of them trying to stop them erodes the trust. And what we need so much more of is to trust our children to go out in the world and make the mistakes that they're going to make. Because I, you know, it's that perspective of I've been there, I've done that. And I don't want you to make the mistakes I've made. Our children aren't, they're going to make their own mistakes. They may mirror something we've done, but there's so much learning in those mistakes. And if we keep the door open 
to our teenagers, if we support them and show up for them, then we get to be a part of cleaning up those mistakes or talking through those mistakes. We either get to be their ally or their enemy. And we either get to be trusted or not. And it, there's so much respect involved at this stage, I think. So much, like trust and respect are the two things that come out for me. And that, you know, I'm just new into an almost 15 year old and like coming up on 13 year old. But I just, if I can trust my child and give him the space he requires, then the door stays open in our relationship. If I'm trying to get up in his business and I'm trying to control it, then that door closes. And I feel like when that door is closed and when you're not, you know, in it together, then that's when there's risk for higher trouble for the teenagers. I don't know. Yeah, Um, no, I love that closed door, open door kind of idea. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? That, with when the door is open, they know we're here and they trust and respect us enough to, you know, come through the door and yes. process with us. And, and you know what I think the big piece of the trust is, is that when we're like offering our perspective or our feedback, comments, suggestions, if they've asked for it, they know that we are, what we're saying is coming um, because we want to help them, yeah. not because we're trying to manipulate them into what we think is the right answer. Absolutely. It's that partnering, like we've said before, it's like partnering with them. And I also, um, well, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, it's that our children also, I always remind myself that I am their safest place in the world, or that's what I long to be, right? Mm-hmm. I want to be their soft landing spot, their safest place. So that's probably why when they're trying out a new um, attitude or a new um, philosophy or a new um moral, that they're going to test it on me because they trust that no matter how it lands or what happens, I'm still going to love them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when parents are talking about their, their teenagers being, you know, having attitude or whatever, they're trying some stuff out on you. And if you can receive it in that open hearted space, then the feedback you have to offer them is going to be received in that you know, in that same space and that same vein. Yeah. yeah. And so I always try to remind myself and I also remember what it was like to be a teenager. And I remind myself that all of a sudden you're going along as a child and now you've got these new hormones in your body and you're like, what is happening? And that's Mm -hmm. going to come out messy. I mean, it comes out messy in me and I'm a 44 year old woman. I know. (laughs) So for me to expect my child just coming into these new hormones to be better at it than I am is a ridiculous expectation. (laughs) That's quite the expectation, isn't it? Right. (laughs) I can't meet it. (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's, it's, I loved, I love, love, love the teen years, you know, because they are, oh, it's just so um, fascinating and enjoyable to see them exploring the world through their perspective and, and seeing how they take it, how they process it, Mm -hmm. what they do with it. Because, you know, as we were saying earlier, we learned so much from them because they're coming at it from such a different place than we were when we experienced it. Right. So like you said, even if uh, uh, a choice that doesn't go as they wanted to kind of mirrors a choice that we had, it's still such a different experience yeah. because we both, we were coming at that from a, such a very different perspective when it happens to us mm-hmm. and the way they process it is often more than likely going to be so much different than the way we did back then. Right. And I also think when we're creating this beautiful space for our kids to unfold naturally as the humans that they are, what I see in my own boys is they're, they're able to slip from teenager to child with this great ease, 
right? Yes. That they can one moment, they can be doing this, what to me seems like this very grown up thing. And the next moment they're engaged in this role playing game with their younger brother. And they don't, they do it with wild abandon. Like I think park days are the best example of that. When you have these multi-aged groups and your teenager shows up and leads the kids through this cooperative game and is laughing like the child they were at seven years of age. Um, and so that, I think it, when we're giving them the creative space or creating the space for them to unfold, we're giving the, them the freedom to slip in and out of those worlds with, with total ease. And I love watching that. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's such a huge piece. And I know Lissy talks about how her, her photography, um, you know, her goal has become to uh, bring that piece of childhood back to adults because that's what she saw so much in her teen years. Um, she saw it disappear from the lives of her, you know, schooled friends. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. She's, and that has been her passion for her pictures and behind her pictures so much oh, is wow. that reminding adults that childhood is still awesome and accessible and mm -hmm. you can still visit it. Right. Yeah. Wow. I, I like that a lot. Yeah. Okay. Our last question. Okay. Um, a couple of months ago, you posted a very cool piece on your blog titled parenting is who I am. And one of my favorite lines was turning toward parenting as who I am and not a job I do affords me the freedom to be my best self at each turn of the journey. So can you talk uh, a bit about that shift away from seeing parenting as a job and what it means to you? Oh, I, oh. I yeah, it was such a great, I, I think it was in Shonda Rhimes' Year of Yes when she gave language to something I'd sort of been pulling at. Um, when, you know, the I think it is in our mainstream society, it really is set up that parenting is a job. It's something that you have to do. And yeah. so to me, a job has a heavy weight to it. It is something I'm trying to get done, trying to get through, looking for vacation. But when I can sh turn it around and... I am a parent. That is who I am. Well, if that is who I am, if that's the thing people are going to talk about at the end of my life, well, then I want to do it with the highest level of integrity. I want to do it from a place of love and kindness and connection. And so the words that I hang on to it are um, come from a completely more positive and grounded space. And it also helps me see myself through my children's eyes. And I, I don't want to be remembered in their adult life as the person who did the dishes. I want to be remembered as the person who held their hand when they cried or the person who, um, you know, danced with them in the middle of the hockey rink because a really great song came on. And so it's that little shift in language that brings me more grounded into the person that I am and how I bring that to my parenting and to my life with them. It helps us like being in the moment, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's funny. The way when you were talking about it just then, I didn't make the connection, um, you know, when I was reading your piece, but just when you were talking about it there, it reminded me of a blog post I wrote called, are you playing the role of mother? Mm. And there that is, it's the same kind of idea, right? It's like, this is my job. I need to be mother yes. right now and I need that vacation time later. I need my time off away. Whereas when you see it as part of who you are, you're in the moment as that person mm -hmm. all the time because that's who you are. And it, it doesn't mean that you never have time alone, but it it's that that time alone isn't escaping the role of mother. It's that's just I as a person need some time and you, you know, Figure, it, figure it out, how it flows, right? <laughs> exactly. And I think mother is something to me, like sometimes when I think of mother, the world has a whole bunch of definitions about what mother is and what mom is and what mother and mom do. But when I pull it back into who I am, then it becomes individual and it, it becomes like my heart space. And my heart space mm -hmm. has always been to bring love and connection into the world even before I had my children. And so 
Um, it really does, like you say, it really makes it mine and it really makes it about who I am being all of the time. Of course, I want to be loving to them. And sometimes the most loving thing I can do is go take a nap, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which, you know, works for all of us. And so it also creates the space for the kids to see you too as that full human being. And they always want to help you, not always, but a lot of the time they want to help you too, as much as you want to help them. Yeah, that's be I have goosebumps now cuz yeah. That 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 is that's the heart of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, that's awesome. Well, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Shannon. I had a great time. <laughs> I did too. Thank you for reaching out. I really really enjoyed this conversation and like every time when we when I talk about this, I feel even more grounded in what I'm doing. So I thank you for creating the space for that. Oh, th no problem at all. I love it too. It is, it's inspiring and, and I go away every time, you know, more ready to engage with yeah. my day and <laughs> yeah. my kids and my family. <laughs> Absolutely. So before we go, can you let everyone know where the best place for uh, them to connect with you online is? Um, the, my writing is all at breakingdaylight.org. And from there, there's a way to contact me and a way to sign up to get um, posts into your inbox. So that's probably the best spot to start. That is awesome. Thank you so much and have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to pick up your free copy of my book, What is Unschooling? In it, we'll explore some of the common questions people have when they first hear about unschooling, like how will my child learn? How do I know they're learning? What is de-schooling? And how do I get started? It's also available at many online ebook retailers. And if you'd like to connect online, you can find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.